it's my great pleasure to introduce Matteo Lostalgio from uh, from Delft currently. Uh, so uh, Matteo uh, did his uh, PhD uh, in the UK in uh, Imperial College with uh, David Jennings and uh, Peter Rudolph, and then uh, yeah, he he came to uh, to ICFO, and this is where we met. Uh, so traditionally, uh, Matteo is interested in thermodynamics and, uh, but quantum thermodynamics, but also inter like intersections between quantum uh, quantum thermodynamics and uh, foundations of uh, yeah, funda uh, foundations of quantum mechanics, like uh, contextuality, uh, especially. And uh, yeah, recently he moved to uh, he moved to uh, Netherlands. Uh, and just started working in QTEC, I, I believe. Uh, yes, and virtually. Today we will tell us about, uh, okay, the title changed maybe a bit, but like about certifying uh, quantum features in uh, quantum heat engines. So the, the floor is yours, Matteo. Uh, so you thank you very much, Mikhail, for the invitation and the kind introduction. And uh, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, I hope you're doing well. Um, as Mikhail mentioned, so this is going to be a talk on uh, quantum signatures and how do you certify them and with an application to thermodynamics. Um, so this is the um, archive number if you're interested in, in more details. And, uh, and feel free to stop me anytime for asking me questions uh, if something is not clear. So, um, so uh, just to give you a quick uh, context, there are, um, of course, many different directions and frameworks within the field of quantum thermodynamics. But I think um, most people uh, in the community agree that it would be nice to uh, eventually find a way in which uh, we can harness a quantum advantage in a quantum machine, uh, in a quantum ferrodynamic protocol, and uh, hopefully with some also uh, technological impact. Uh, a little bit in a similar way in which uh, quantum features were first identified and then harnessed in other contexts like cryptography, computing, and other areas. Um, in the field of quantum ferrodynamics, I think we are quite far from uh, that objective, but um, I would argue that an uh, important milestone along the way is to find reliable ways in which one can certify uh, a quantum signature in, in a machine. And um, in this talk, I would like to um, convince you about uh, why um, this task is important. So why do we need uh, certificates? Um, and Secondly, I would like to go into the question of how can you do it actually and uh, tell you um, a little bit about how you build up this a framework in which you can um, frame and answer this question in a rigorous manner. And finally, I will tell you a little bit about what the outlook of this work and what could be future steps uh, to, to push this forward further. Um, so let me start with the question of um, what is a quantum advantage and uh, as it often uh, as it is often the case it's sometimes easier to actually answer the opposite question what is not a quantum advantage and, um, and maybe I should mention that it's very common in quantum thermodynamics to uh, if you have some you devise some quantum engine or some other quantum thermodynamic protocol what you do you, you look at what happens when you destroy quantum effects. So for example, by adding measurements that destroy quantum interference, or you add the dephasing in the energy basis or things that destroy quantum features. And then you look at what happens to your machine. And if your machine is working worse after you do that, then uh, you often claim that there is a quantum signature or even a quantum advantage. And um, I would like to point out why this criterion is actually very limited by using a funny example, um, which uh, it's called here the quantum toaster, uh, which is uh, inspired by conversation with David Jennings. Um, so what is a quantum toaster? So this is a classical engine or any other machine. So a toaster, for example, where uh, you attach to the switch of your engine uh, just, just a standard Mark Sender interferometer. 
and what happens is that simply you're shooting uh, photons one after the other inside the interferometer. The photon is evolving in a superposition of the two, um, the two branches, and then by uh, constructive interference is coming out of uh, this bright port, port one, and it's turning on the engine for a single stroke. And so your, uh, your engine or your quantum toaster has a, a power, if you want, of one toast per photon. Okay, so this is your machine. And then what you do, well, you apply just a standard criterion, which is to say, well, what happens if I, if I destroy the quantum interference in the machine? In this case, you can do it by doing a which way inform, um, measurement of, which is going to reveal the which path information. So it's gonna uh, tell you if the uh, photon is in the lower branch or in the upper branch of the interferometer. And of course, they're gonna see it with 50% probability in the lower branch and with 50% probability in the, in the upper branch. Now the photon is just going to move through the path and goes through the semi-reflected mirror. And of course, with 50% probability, it's going to come out from port one. And with 50% probability, it's coming out from port two after the measurement. So with 50% probability, it does nothing. With 50% probability, it's turning on the machine. So that um, after um, destroying interference, your machine is now having a, a performance, if you want, of preparing half toast for each photon. So half of the performance from before. So of course, uh, right, this is just a, a somehow a cheeky example, but what I would like to point out is that, of course, the fact that adding, uh, destroying quantum interference in your, in your machine is diminishing its uh, performance, it tells you really nothing about um, if you're witnessing or not a quantum advantage. And in this case, the reason why uh, this is happening is very obvious. The fact is just I can just take my classical machine here, the toaster in this case, and just use that. And I would have exactly the same performance as the full quantum machine. I can just throw away completed interferometer. So the quantum effects are present, but they are completely irrelevant really, because I can emulate the machine in a completely classical way. So um, what I'm getting to with uh, this example is just that what we need to formalize is the question of, uh, if I'm given a quantum machine, so I'm given a machine, um, is there a classical emulation? And this is really the, the question that we want to answer because the machines that are actually interesting and useful are the ones that you cannot uh, emulate classically. Now, to answer this question, of course, one needs to formalize the notion of what is a classical emulator first. And then secondly, once that is formalized, you need to find criteria that are going to tell you when such emulation can be rolled out. Okay, so this is the two steps that I'm going to follow um, in this talk. Um, so let me start with the question of what is a classical emulation? How do we formalize the notion of a classical emulator? Um, so before I just jump into the formal definition of what I will uh, define as a classical emulator, let me start by looking at the, at the literature just to get some examples of um, emulators that have been actually uh, being used in, uh, in, in the context of thermodynamics. So um, the, somehow the obvious one is just to take Hamiltonian dynamics. No? So you've got a bunch of particles or oscillators, and then you're using that as a system that is trying to emulate effects that may be present in quantum machines. So for example, in this paper in quantum in 2017, they were studying certain claims that uh, quantum coherence in the initial system can uh, enhance uh, cooling in cooling protocols. And what they were doing was to emulate the same effect just simply using uh, classical oscillators. Uh, so certainly we would like to include um, any sort of phase space model with Hamilton, some Hamiltonian interaction and uh, you know, some general classical mechanics model. That's certainly a possible uh, classical emulator. 
Uh, but there are, of course, other models. For example, in this uh, paper uh, from two, sorry, yeah. Mateo, can I uh, can I ask something? So, yeah. wh what what do you mean by what do authors mean by emulating uh, this cultural? Yeah. Experience? So, in what sense, like? Yeah. So they were reproducing the qualitative features of the dynamics. So, in particular, in this case, mm -hmm. you you had that you could um, instead of just letting a system formalize in contact with an environment. Um, um, if the system had some uh, quantum coherence between different energies, you had, of course, some oscillations uh, as well as a thermalization. And then you could exploit, you could stop the thermalization as a, at a dip of the oscillation in a way that you maximize the, the ground state population. So instead of just waiting till uh, uh, the long time uh, thermalization, you can stop before by exploit, exploiting this oscillation and stop at a point where you have a higher ground state population and then they were claiming okay this is this doesn't happen if i deface in the energy basis so this is a somehow a, a coherent enhanced cooling uh, phenomenon but then if you just take our, um, what they are doing here was to reproduce essentially the same behavior in a yeah in a classical system uh, in an oscillator uh, essentially so yeah, that's that's that was the idea. What is here. important is that it's somehow the the simulation is efficient also, right? Because in in a sense you can when you take any complicated quantum system in principle you can emulate it classically, but maybe with a huge cost. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so of course there are different notions that you could use, no, in terms of complexity of the simulation or uh, different notions may be more re relevant to um, different scenarios. Uh, here I will take uh, contextuality, non-contextuality as a notion, so as I will come to in a second. Um, but so this list was just to give you a non-exhaustive list of possible models that you can think in the back of your head when I say there is no classical emulator, you can think, okay, there is no Hamiltonian dynamics simulating this thing. Or uh, for the second case, there is no, so this was a model where you've got uh, your states are just different energies, and then uh, you've, you've got a rate equation um, that tells you what probability you jump from some energy to another. So it's this kind of a stochastic uh, Markovian uh, model. Uh, and in this paper here from 2019 was, uh, these models were, it was studied to what extent these models can reproduce uh, uh, effects that were uh, seen in quantum coherent engines. So that really the coherence in those engines, engines is not really instrumental for, well, whatever performance they were achieving. And uh, finally, another obvious model that one can have is just you take quantum mechanics, you completely deface in a given basis, as in the example before, that gives you some uh, stochastic model, uh, which is just basically quantum mechanics in a, in a fixed uh, basis. So all of these are possible, um, are possible classical emulators. So the question is, how do you capture all of them within a single uh, framework, essentially? So, so the task, again, is to certify that none of these models exist for the phenomenon that you are studying. Um, so uh, what I will show you in a second is that these are all, all uh, well, what one can see is that uh, these are all examples of a class of models that are known as non-contextual ontological models. So in the next slide, I will tell you exactly what these are. But, uh, you know, just to, for concreteness, you can know we go back to any of these classes of examples here. Um, and the question uh, will be uh, that I uh, mentioned at the beginning will be formulated as uh, can we certify that a quantum thermodynamic protocol cannot be emulated by any non contextual ontological model? So, this is what I will, uh, I will um, mean by a classical emulator. So, let me define what these models are. Um, so, uh, so these are, um, so I will always refer to them as classic emulators, but, uh, in, in, if you're more familiar with the foundation literature, these are usually called ontological models. So, uh, when you think about emulation, it's useful to distinguish between three different categories. So one here on the left, uh, is the operational description 
uh, of your experiment. So you can think about the experiment as a kind of a sequence of black boxes where, uh, which correspond to um, the procedures that you're following to set up, set up your, your system. This is the preparation procedure P. Um, some uh, set of instructions that you're following to transform your, your initial system into some new, uh, uh, into some new state, which is your uh, transformation procedure T. And finally, you're going to perform, again, as I think fold in terms of a list of instructions, a measurement procedure that is extracting outcomes from your system. And the bare data that you're collecting is this probability here, which is just the probability that you get certain outcomes K, given that you follow the preparation procedure P, transformation procedure T, and measurement procedure M, okay? So typically we talk about quantum experiments and then we give the quantum description of those experiments. So the preparation procedure is going to be uh, simply described by a density operator rho. The transformation procedure, it's described in general by a quantum channel epsilon, a completely positive and trace preserving map. And the measurement procedure will be described by associating a set of uh, positive operators to each outcome, so a P of M, okay? And then if this is a quantum experiment, so if this statistics is being collected in a quantum experiment by the Born rule, we should be able to explain this data as uh, the trace of epsilon of rho on EK, okay? So these are the quantum descriptions of preparation, uh, transformation and measurement corresponding to these operational procedures. So now what is a classical emulation? When in a classical emulation, to be completely general, what you've got is some set of states that I'm going to denote by lambda. For example, in Hamiltonian dynamics, this is just, uh, these are just points in phase space, okay? Um, so, and then what you say is, okay, when I prepare my system, so I do this preparation procedure, P, what I'm actually doing, in terms of my classical emulation is just to prepare in general some state row or so some state row or in general a probability distribution over uh, my, uh, my simulation states row. So for example, this may be a probability distribution of a phase space in, uh, in, in Hamiltonian dynamics. Um, secondly, one, what, what's the corresponding element to transformations in your classical emulation? Well, to be fully general, once again, this is just um, some uh, update rule. So something that tells you if your state was lambda, what's the, uh, what's the probability that from lambda you're going to jump to some lambda prime? So this is this probability here. So the jump probability, which is associated to this transformation procedure thing. So once again, this may be a deterministic rule as it happens in Hamiltonian dynamics. So lambda prime is just the phase space point evolved uh, from, from the initial phase space point lambda, or it may be a stochastic rule, like in the other example I was mentioning with the Markovian model with jumps between states, these are just the probability of jumping. No? Um, and finally, the measurement procedure here in the simulation is just associated to some rule that tells you if the state is lambda prime, what's the probability that you output some outcome K if you do measurement M, okay? Um, so once you're given all of these various uh, probabilities, then just by uh, propagation of the probabilities, how is the uh, model explaining the data? Well, the model is explaining the data as follows. Now you've got some probability that you prepare lambda, then some probability that from lambda you're jumping to lambda prime, and finally, some probability that from lambda prime, given that you have lambda prime, you output the outcome K in the measurement. And then you just need to sum over all of the lambda lambda primes, okay? So you're asking here if a given statistics, which is uh, coming out of, of some quantum experiment, can be actually explained by a model like that. Um, now, um, of course, uh, well, of course, uh, the, the, this, is, this cannot be everything. 
because actually the mo models like uh, these ones that I just introduced are able to explain any statistics that you want. Okay, so quantum, post-quantum, anything that you, you can, give me anything, you can actually find an appropriate model to emulate it. So since we, what we want to define is a classical emulator, we need to add some constraint of some kind. So in this case, uh, I'm going to use this notion of contextuality. So this is a strong notion of non-classicality uh, that was introduced by Speckens in 2005 and it generalizes a famous notion of non-classicality from the 60s from Caution and Specker. Um, so to tell you what this is, I need one more, uh, one last definition, which is um, a natural definition of what it means for two procedures to be operationally equivalent. So two procedures can be preparation, transformations, or measurement. So they are called operationally equivalent when they, um, they just give you the same statistics in any experiment. So they cannot be distinguished in any experiment. So for example, if I give you two different transformation procedures, T and T prime, I'm going to say that these are operationally equivalent here. Uh, when? Well, when if I use T or I use T prime, it doesn't matter. I get the same statistics in any experiment. So here is the probabilities that I collect in any experiment. So with any preparation and measurement that I want by doing T. And here is the probability distributions that I obtain the statistics that I collect, if you want, if I use T prime and do any preparation and any measurement. So the definition of operational equivalence is just that they are, these things are the same for any experiment that you do. So there is just no experiment that allows you to distinguish between these two transformations. So they are operational equivalent. Um, the notion of non-contextuality is then the following. If you're given two things, two, procedures that are completely equivalent operationally, then they should be described in the same way in the model. So for example, here I said, say that these two guys cannot be distinguished in any experiment, okay? Then the requirement of non-contextuality is that the update rule, remember that every transformation is associated to update an update rule, so there will be an update rule associated to T, which is this one, and then there will be an update rule associated to T prime. So in general, this may be different, but the, uh, the constraint that non-contextuality is imposing here is that because these two transformations cannot be distinguished in any experiment, they should be described in the same way in the, in the, uh, in the emulator. So this is the notion of non-contextuality here, generalized notion of non-contextuality. So uh, the question um, that uh, I'm uh, going to try to answer then is, can we certify that a given thermodynamic protocol cannot be emulated by any non-contextual uh, model? So this is what um, I, will, uh, I will look into. Uh, sorry, Matteo, can, uh, yeah, yeah. can I ask you something? Yes, and I'm not going to ask about convexity. <laughs> You're not going to ask about convexity. Well, oh, no, I was no. expecting that you were asking about convexity. So if you zoom here very much, <laughs> very much. Oh! I have yet yes, to <laughs> how there is also. <laughs> no, but I said. But this is, yes. Yes, well, sorry. But, okay, you're trolling me. Okay, but what I wanted to ask actually, okay? Yes. Is... Uh, uh, what, what I wanted to ask, uh, actually, so were there some developments regarding this notion of contextuality when uh, uh, when you don't have such a like simple prepare and measure scenario? So I mean, we discussed it like a while ago. So I sort of because of you, I, I got to learn this context contextuality due to seconds, right? Uh, but it's like. Like it, it, it has some limitation in this scenario, mainly it's like just prepare, transform, and, and measure. So the people try to generalize it to somehow sequential yeah. Yeah. scenarios, some interventions. No, okay, I think, I think it's, uh, yeah, as we discussed, I think it's a very interesting question. So luckily it will not be necessary for this uh, particular application. 
but I think it is a very interesting question and I I'm not aware I mean I'm not maybe the completely updated on with everything that was done but I'm not aware of that so I think it's still a nice question to ask um, so yes okay um, but I will remember this this uh, thing that you wrote there about the linearity man. yes uh, we got the video so <laughs> yes so <laughs> very good <laughs> uh, um okay so oh, i see you're not seeing can you see this next slide well i see it's people can hear in mind yeah i can see, okay it's coming it's just a bit slow um okay maybe um i don't know if uh, this Okay, the, I imagine so. If especially if you didn't see uh, these notions before of non-contextuality, may, this may be a little bit confusing. So I, I'll try um, maybe to give a different perspective. I don't know if it's useful or not. But so you've got these sets of models, which are these non-contextual ontological models. And as I mentioned uh, before, um, uh, you can always think about some of the examples. So some of the uh, models that we are trying to exclude, that we are going to exclude. Now we're going to exclude all models in this set. So including, for example, um, all possible Hamiltonian dynamics with generic um, interactions, any number of particles, oscillators, whatever Hamiltonian you want. So you can think about in these terms. So we are excluding all of those models and other models as well. Um, a different perspective, however, is, um, is the following actually what we are excluding is the possibility of finding a positive quasi probability representation for your uh, for your experiment so a, a um, quasi probability representation is one where for every uh, density operator you associate some probability distribution for every channel you associate um, update probability and for every POVM um, you associate a response function okay uh, so this is what it is um, for example one example that is uh, quite well known inside this set is the Wigner function for example um, but there are many others and the what you exclude by excluding the existence of non-contextual ontological model is you're excluding that there is any quasi probability representation of your experiment that is positive okay so if you try with the Wigner function, it will come out negative. If you try with any other quasi probability distribution, it will have some negativity. So that's uh, a different way if you if you want to see uh, what is the recertifying. Okay, so maybe if this other framework was you're more familiar with that one, you can think in those terms. One way or another, we are excluding a very large set of uh, of models and we want to certify that none of them can reproduce the features that we are uh, studying okay so now let me get to how do you actually uh, certify uh, that a given uh, experiment does not admit any of these models or any of these classical emulations so um, this is a recipe uh, uh, sorry my that was a slight is yeah. again broken uh, at least I see it broken. Yeah, I, I, I was, yeah, I, I see when I look in the other screen that it is. Uh, I don't know if it's just time, so it will actually. Oh, okay. No, it's good. Okay. Maybe we need to move uh, a little every time. Yeah, maybe I need, yeah, I don't know why. Um, sorry about that. Um, so you, um, so you, the recipe is made of two steps. Uh, it works for generic, uh, linear response theory. So it's quite generally. Uh, sorry, sorry Mateo, I don't know if you observed chat, but we just got a question ah. from uh, Rafael. So uh, I, I can read Rafael, it. Rafael, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Yes, I, I, I okay, so I read. Otherwise... Uh, <laughs> it means uh -huh. that it is a definite. So the question is, I didn't understand this definition of non-contextuality. It means that it is a definition about comparisons between different realizations. And that's a relative definition. Um, yeah, so I think one way to maybe uh, 
to say it in a different way is that if I give you, um, for example, a, a quantum channel, because this is what will matter here. So there are different ways in which um, the channel can be realized in practice. No? Or if I give you a state, there is a one density operator, but there are different decompositions of that density operator. So what you want is that there is just a single object in the, in the emulation that is associated to that single object in quantum mechanics. So if there is one channel, there will be one update rule. If there is one density operator, there will be one probability distribution. You don't want that, oh, you need also to specify me other information, which is the context. For example, which particular decomposition of the density operator are you talking about? And then depending on the decomposition, I give you a different probability. You know? So you don't want that. So the models that have this feature that you need to tell me not, for example, only the density operator, you also need to tell me, oh, it's the decomposition of, uh, it's the mixture of one half, one half, zero and one. It's, uh, then it's this probability. And if it's the, the composite, if it's a mixture of one half probability plus one half probability minus, is this other probability? Those models are called contextual in this generalized sense. The other models, the models which are which gives you unique prescriptions, are called no contextual. I don't know if this is a bit clearer. Okay, if if we. If it's not, uh, just just write me write me again. Sorry, your microphone is broken. Um, so uh, okay, so this is the recipe. So you give me a quantum system, so uh, governed by some Hamiltonian h of t with some system Hamiltonian uh, uh, h of zero uh, plus some coupling g times the perturbation v of t. Okay, um, assume. Uh, Okay, maybe I'll, I'll, okay, we can, uh, I'll, I'll try to, we can try to go back at the end of the talk, okay. Um, but for the moment, just think about some of these models that we are excluding, all of classical mechanics, for example, we are excluding all those models, okay. Um, okay, so, uh, so you're given a quantum system and assume that you compute the linear response of that system and you find that it's uh, showing some linear response, okay? So for example, you have some observable you're interested in and this observable is responding linearly in the coupling parameter G, okay? Okay, that's the first step of the recipe. The second step is you need to verify a technical condition, which is essentially, you need to verify the positivity for certain matrix. Um, this matrix is just um, built using the eigenvalues of this operator here. Uh, which is just a linear response operator. So this is an operator that you need to compute just to compute the linear response. It's the time integral of the of the perturbation in the interaction picture. Uh, so you need so you need to compute this to compute the linear response, and you need the eigenvalues here. So the eigenvalues go inside this matrix, and then you need to compute a positivity condition. Uh, okay. So sorry, sorry, Matteo. Can yeah. I? Because uh, maybe not everybody is familiar with this linear response theory, I imagine. So just the system is like you, you drive your system uh, via, yeah. you, have, you have this driving, right? And you have some small parameter. And then like, what is actually the experiment? Uh, like, or the, the, do you uh, look how some operation, some expectation value evolves? Yeah, so, or? Yeah, so you've got, uh, so you just got a unitary driving. Uh, so this is the Hamiltonian of the system. So this part is the uh, is the driving. So this is zero at the initial time, and then you turn it on. Uh, there is some coupling strength in front, and you're going to compute how a certain observable O is reacting, uh, and you're doing an expansion for small g. So you okay. do a linear expansion, expansion, and this condition in this recipe here. The first condition is that the uh, first order response is non-zero because it could be that the first order term just vanishes. No, so you're asking that the um, that the uh, yeah that the response or the change in your favorite observable uh, in uh, when you do the the um, you how do you say you you do the series in terms of G 
it has a, a first order uh, response. So this delta O will be of order G. So this is the first requirement. The second requirement, it's a bit more obscure, but I will uh, come back to what it actually implies. Uh, but it's essentially a technical condition where what you need to do is to take uh, this operator here and uh, compute this guy and uh, obtain the eigenvalues. And the eigenvalues go inside a matrix and you need to compute the positivity. Uh, it's not very enlightening in terms, it's just a technical condition, but we'll come back to it in a second. Uh, so can I ask um, what else, do you, is it in, in the interaction picture or not? In the, oh, it doesn't matter because it's eigenvalue. Okay, sorry, no, forget. No, yeah, it, um, it does matter because you're doing an integral, no? But it is, so it is in the interaction picture here. Oh, okay. I think it matters, no? Because you're, yeah. Ah, because so, it may not commute, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, so say you just check these two things. So these are just two things that you can somehow use as a black box. You just check those two things, and then you can use the theorem. Uh, this is the main result of this uh, of the work, which is whenever these two conditions are satisfied, then every non-contextual emulator will have a order g square response. So, in any non-contextual emulator, the response to the to the perturbation of the observable O can be at most of something of order g square. Okay, cannot be bigger than g square. So, uh, because quantum mechanics has a response of order G, you immediately obtain a contradiction, which is there is no there is no emulator that can have a response which is strong enough to reproduce what you are seeing in quantum mechanics. So that's the uh, the general idea, and you can apply this to essentially any linear response scenario. Okay. Um, so let me then go back to what this technical condition means. I give you a quick proof sketch. I'm not going to go in any detail, but just to tell you what's going on, because um, just to hopefully will be a bit more understanding of what's happening behind the curtains, let's say. So there is this technical condition here, but what this technical condition is implying, so this positivity of this matrix, is that um, if you take your unitary U, uh, which is the unitary, the driving unitary in interaction picture. So if you mix it with its inverse, okay, this would be, this will admit a decomposition of this kind, one minus PD times the identity plus PD times some channel C for G small enough. So here C is some channel. So this is just some channel. And PD is some uh, probability, which importantly scales with order G square. So essentially it's, uh, it's telling you that this decomposition exists. Okay. Um, now, why is this uh, useful? Well, this is useful because it allows you to use your non-contextuality assumption. So now remember that what's happening in any classical emulation. In any classical emulation, you're going to have that to the, your unitary, the driving, you're associating some update rule in your set of uh, states lambda that are emulating the experiment. To your U dagger, you're associating some other probability, some other, there is some other update probability. Uh, to the identity, you're going to associate just the delta function on, uh, on the set of uh, lambda states, your simulation states. And finally, to your C, there is some other P bar, let me call it, update probability that is associated to it. Now, in general, all these four things can be whatever they want, uh, as long as they are positive, they sum to one and so on. Uh, so they are actual uh, jump probabilities. But in a, in a non-contextual model, what happens is that you have got you uh, you have got a constraint. Why uh, you have got a constraint? Well, look again at this. This is a channel equality, so it's written as a quantum uh, equality.
quality. But if you think about it, this is just an operational equivalence. Why it's an operational equivalence? Well, it's telling you the following uh, in practice, in, uh, in, in, in uh, operational terms, it's telling you the following fact. If you, you, if you take your unitary U and you mix it with one up probability with its inverse, this is going to be indistinguishable for any statistics that you collect in any experiment from just doing nothing with probability one minus P and applying some other channel with probability P. Okay, so because these two things are exactly the same, so you cannot distinguish them in any experiment, the assumption of non-contextuality is going to require that the same uh, your uh, update rules, meaning that one half the probability you associate to you plus one half the probability you associate to you dagger. This is what you associate here and then you've got on the right hand side you've got something like this you have got one minus p delta plus p d p bar and the assumption of non-contextuality is telling you that these two things should be the same because uh, because there is no way of distinguishing between these two different ways of doing the same channel in the same way these things should be described in the same way in your simulation. So that's the assumption of non-contextuality. And this is why uh, here there are a few uh, more steps, but it is this constraint that is implying the fact that if you then look at the, uh, how much you can perturb any observable in any non-contextual model, this turns out to be bounded by something of the order G square. Okay. And specifically, it's a bound of this kind, 2PD times O max here, where PD, as I mentioned, has order G square, and O max is the maximum eigenvalue of O. So here, there is a small caveat, as you see, that uh, this is perfectly okay for any finite dimensional system, but if you're interested in unbounded observables, there may be some um, yeah, more technical details. You, know, you may need some cutoff or uh, you need to pay attention basically to that. Um, okay, so this shows you that no classic emulator can explain, in the presence of this operation equivalence, no classic emulator can explain a response larger than order G square. So whenever you have got a, a order G quantum response, you can immediately conclude that uh, your uh, quantum experiment cannot be uh, reproduced classically, okay? Um, okay, so um, let me give you an application of, of this result to uh, quantum thermodynamics. It was my main motivation to actually take a quantum machine and show that, that the performance of that machine can be certified to be uh, impossible to reproduce by any of these classical models, okay? So in particular by any classical mechanics model, more generally by any non-contextual ontological model. Um, to do that, I will use a simple uh, model, which is the two-stroke engine. So the um, two-stroke engine is a, a two-step engine, and it works like that, like this. So uh, you start with two baths. So you got a hot bath and a cold bath, okay? And in the first stroke, your quantum system is coming in and it's interacting simultaneously with both the cold and the hot bath. So this is the first stroke. Then the system comes out. So say it comes out in some state raw. And once it comes out, what you do, you do uh, a unitary interaction that it's, it's trying to uh, lower its energy. So you're getting some energy out. So you're doing a work extraction step. So here, some work is coming out. So this is the second stroke, is a work extraction stroke. stroke. So the first stroke is preparing some non-equilibrium state and the second stroke is getting some work out. And then you can just repeat. So you can just 
plug in a new system or in general, well, you can just plug in the same system back into the, into the buff and repeat. You just do first stroke, second stroke, first stroke, second stroke and so on. Um, so let me assume here that this system is a QB because this simplifies a lot the uh, description and also because people often uh, make this assumption. Now, it was uh, realized already for quite some time, the following fact that if your system is coming out, so in a, in a state, um, so sorry, if the state of your system is, is such that it doesn't commute with the system Hamiltonian, so once, once it's coming out here from the first stroke, then the work output of the machine in the, uh, if you look at the linear response regime, which is just a weak coupling limit, um, the work output is going to be of order G in the coupling strength, okay, of the second stroke. So the second stroke is exactly like the, 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 the scenario I described before, you've got some time dependent Hamiltonian, which generates this unitary here. And this time dependent Hamiltonian is H0 plus G times some perturbation. So this is the G that appears here. Um, so if the state doesn't commute with H0, the work output is proportional to G. However, if you, um, if you destroy um, interference effects, for example, by a strong dephasing in the energy basis, then the after the first stroke, so here you introduce a, a, a destruction of your uh, quantum feature, then rho is going to commute with H0 because you make it diagonal in the energy basis. And then the work is now proportional to G squared. Okay, so this was realized a mm, long time ago, or some, I don't know exactly who was the first, but it's some years that this is known. And uh, again, it was, uh, it was then stated that this was a quantum advantage that is displayed by this machine. But of course, I go back to the um, example of the quantum toaster. So is it actually, is this a true quantum advantage or not? Because just by looking at the defaced engine and seeing that the, the, um, the machine performs worse because here we are in the weak coupling limit, so G is very small and G square is much smaller than G, doesn't tell you anything. However, um, we can apply the recipe you know, that I mentioned before. The recipe had two steps. The first step was just to see that you've got some linear response and you have got some linear response here. So whenever rho is not commuting with H0, you've got linear response. So the first step is satisfied of the recipe. The second step was that technical condition there, but luckily what happens is that for qubits uh, and any non trivial perturbation, this condition is automatically satisfied. So also the second uh, condition in, the, in this two step uh, recipe is satisfied. So what can you conclude? Well, you can conclude that the, um, the power output of a two-stroke engine um, does not admit any classical emulator. So it's not the case that it's just, you know, just by comparing with the deface version that you lose some power, which tells you nothing, it's actually, um, um, it's actually impossible to reproduce the power output um, in any classical emulator. Uh, okay. A question, Matteo? Yes, yes, please. Uh, so I was wondering here, uh, your work that you are using is just the difference in the expected energy and you optimize over all unitaries? Yeah, you you don't optimize over you, all unitaries. You just do some unitary, uh, which of course needs to be a unitary that some non-trivial thing because it needs you need to see a, a order G response here. You don't need to do the optimal thing as long as you do something which um, uh, is non-trivial so that you get actual linear response. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. No problem. Thanks for the question. Any other question?
Okay, so um, okay, so let me let me um, go towards uh, the outlook then. Um, so so I I showed you how you can um, uh, certify uh, quantum features in general linear response scenarios, um, and I uh, apply this to a two-stroke engine. So I think um, this gives you a way to, you know, it gives you a rigorous setting in which you can uh, verify that a given quantum effects cannot be reproduced by any classical model. It's not that, you know, you haven't found one, but that it actually doesn't exist and gives you a rigorous way to test it. Um, so the question is, how would you move forward, uh, you know, along this ideal path I was talking uh, at the beginning? Um, and I think, um, uh, what would be a nice next step would be to uh, get uh, somehow better certificates. So uh, what I mean by that is that um, if you look at how the certificate works, um, it worked because you, you had the second uh, point in this two-step recipe, and the second point was implying a certain operational equivalence that was an operational equivalence that told you that mixing your unitary driving with its inverse, it's essentially, uh, you're going to essentially reverse the unitary to first order in G. So this is going to be equal to one minus P identity plus P C, where the, the amount that you're not identity is only order G squared. No? And the assumption of non-contextuality applies certain constraints on the model that follow from this operational equivalence. So essentially what, you, what you've got is that in quantum mechanics, you just observe uh, this operational equivalence. And then because you observe it in quantum mechanics in any uh, classical emulator, you're asking, you're asking to reproduce it. Okay. However, uh, well, you may say, well, why should I reproduce it? Okay, this is true in quantum mechanics. I do see it, uh, but maybe I don't care about emulating this part. Maybe I only care about emulating the power. So what should I, you know, I don't care about this other aspect of the experiment. Um, so you could say, well, then what about finding a certificate that completely does not use the fact that you need to reproduce um, this operational fact here. Well, this is not possible. So can you just remove this constraint? No, you cannot just remove the constraint because then you have got no constraints at all that you are applying. And as I mentioned at the beginning, you can actually reproduce whatever you want if you don't put any constraints in the general uh, set of ontological models. So what you really need to do would be to replace this constraint uh, by something that is more directly relevant to the problem. So um, what is exactly should be the replacement? It's okay, not, not obvious to me, but something uh, yeah, that is more uh, technologically or physically relevant than this uh, condition of stochastic reversibility you know, uh, that I have here. Um, why? Because ultimately what we want is just to have classical emulators that reproduce the um, features that we are actually interested in. We don't care about reproducing everything. We just want to reproduce certain features. So I think there is room for improvement in the sense that there is room to find different certificates that use um, operational features that are more relevant, for example, to a thermodynamic experiment. Um, but I cannot be more precise in this regard. Um, so uh, with this, let me just go to the conclusions. Um, well, what I try to convince you uh, is that uh, if you want to put it in a sen sentence, if a quantum engine looks fancy, it doesn't mean that it is fancy. So you need a certificate. You need to prove that there is no simple classical way of emulating it. Um, I showed you that the order G power scaling of a two-stroke engine can be certified against arbitrary non-contextual emulators. So in particular against arbitrary 
well, Hamiltonian dynamics or classical physics model. Um, the same tools can be used to certify other uh, general linear response uh, scenarios. And in fact, you can also apply to, uh, uh, to phase estimation in local metrology. So that's another application. Um, and you can, yeah, you can use it in principle to quite a broad set of experiments. Um, and finally, as, as I was just mentioning now, I think we still need better certificates that require to only emulate features that are uh, somehow native or strictly relevant to the problem. And I think this, this would be um, a, nice, a nice thing. So we sort of know now that there are quantum machines that definitely cannot be reproduced classically. And I think this is an important milestone uh, to, to get. But um, the next step would be to actually find uh, certificates where uh, yeah, you, you, you prove that there is no way of, yeah, not only of reproducing the machine, but only reproducing some of the relevant features of the machine, whatever these are. Um, so if you're interested in more details, so this is again the archive reference and um, I'll thank you very much for, for listening. Yeah, thank you Mato, for a very nice talk. I'm, I, of course, I'm very happy to answer any questions if there are any. Yes, so are there uh, some questions uh, or comments to tell? Don't be shy, please. Um, I think there is a, a question from Rafael. Sorry? There is a question in the chat. Um, oh. Ah, oh, no, okay, no, sorry. Just, oh, it's the it was just the previous. Yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry. Unless Rafael might still have some questions. <laughs> Please, Paolo, just you don't need to, yeah. <laughs> then I would have a question. So uh, I was trying to somehow connect what, uh, what Michal uh, said at the beginning. That maybe it's a question how efficiently you, you can simulate something classically. So how would you how would you model this uh, in the in this non-contextual approach? Just your non-contextual model would be defined on a larger larger um, phase space, or how how would it look like? Yeah, so I think this is yeah. For maybe this is a different way of putting the question that I was asking here when I said we need better certificates with different constraints. So maybe. Um, um, you know, okay, if, if it was a completely just computational problem, maybe you would just care about the number of states, for example, that you use in the, in the simulation or the length of the, the, the depth of your, uh, of, your, of your simulation. Here, however, is a thermodynamic problem, so likely you are also interested in certain energetic constraints, uh, perhaps, no? that you want to reproduce because you're interested in getting some work out, so you're interested that you know, uh, the models that you're using are, for example, I don't know, not putting more energy in than what they are getting out. Uh, you know, they get a bit more power, but they, I don't know, they waste a lot of energy, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is, this, was, this is not a way of thinking that is common in the foundational uh, community. And I think maybe this is something that coming from the thermodynamic community could be added to, to these kind of models, maybe some energetic constraints, for example. So that you can maybe show that there is no model satisfying certain, I don't know, very natural energetic constraints that can reproduce what you're seeing, you know, for example. So, but yes, I don't know how this can be made in a nice uh, framework to study these questions. Okay, thank you. But yeah, it's a good question. Okay, but uh, can I ask, Okay, this will be like out of the blue, but can it be that, I don't know, some uh, some thermodynamical phenomena, uh, if you assume uh, like uh, this non-contextual model like, cannot, uh, like, cannot be explained on the grounds of, uh, of, of non-contextual model, like, I know, some stuff regarding statistics, I don't know, uh, well, this is the example I presented, no? The work output of a two-stroke engine is exactly one such phenomenon. Um, you cannot get the work output 
uh, given that operational equivalence, which is satisfied in quantum mechanics, the work output of any mm -hmm. classical emulator is at most of order G squared. Whereas the work output, if you start with a quantum coherent system, the work output is of order G. So you cannot sure. reproduce that quantum phenomenon. But I meant phenomenon. like microscopic phenomenon, more like, uh, okay. Just because in the, uh, it's not a criticism, but you had a single qubit, right? In, in a, but of course, it probably generalizes the argument. Um, so yeah, the frame, the, the two, this two-step recipe can be applied uh, to higher dimensional systems um, mm -hmm. to the extent that you can compute uh, the eigenvalues of this uh, linear response operator uh, mm -hmm. and check this positivity condition. Uh, I know for sure that um, no, for qubits, you, you pr basically you don't even need to check the second condition mm -hmm. because it's automatically satisfied. For Q treats onwards, you uh, not every this condition is not always satisfied. So there are counterexamples. So you need to take a linear response experiment with the actual numbers somehow, uh, and uh, and see uh, if if mm -hmm. this method gives you a certificate or not. But yes, it's, it would be interesting, of course, to find also more generally applicable uh, certificates. But I, I hope people can uh, think, uh, yeah, uh, I think there isn't much work about it, but I think it would be nice if more certificates were developed um, yeah. of different kinds okay. also. So can I ask one more? Maybe there are some more questions to Mattel from other people, because I kept asking questions during the talk. No. So, Actually, yeah, sorry. Nina, please. Yeah, if I can ask a little bit. Hi. Uh, so I had a question which now become, I guess, a follow-up to Michal's previous question. So you just mentioned that, and I'm not sure if this is specific to the two-stroke uh, heat engine model. I, I don't know a lot about like different models in, in, in thermodynamics, uh, like quantum thermodynamics, but uh, yeah, you just mentioned that for qubits, uh, the, the second condition is just automatic. Uh, and so, so is there any, any particular reason for that? Maybe like, you know, like Gleason theorems for qubit and qubits are, are different or something like that. Um. Okay, I haven't thought in those terms because it's a bit of um. It's a, so the condition I give is actually just a sufficient condition. It's not necessary. It's not that if I see that that condition is not satisfied, I know that uh, what, what I see is classical. Um, so I always just interpret it as a bit of a messy condition that it just happens to, because qubits are so simple, it just happens to be always satisfied. So that any linear response experiment on a qubit, as long as you have a non-zero linear response, uh, for uh, in the week, in the, yeah, in the let's say we cap limit on the, the very small G limit, then it's always contextual. Um, so, yeah, but I haven't thought if this has some deeper meaning. Uh, mm. It's not, certainly it's not obvious from the tools I'm using that it, it mm -hmm. is some, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. It's just a sufficient condition. Thanks. Because um, on the other hand, as far as I remember, just to follow up, uh, like already for uh, when Speckens proves that, uh, like, uh, uh, single qubits is non contextual, you know, like, pro let's say preparation non contextual, uh, then uh, it's like he, I mean, okay, what I remember is that when you have continuum of states, right, uh, in the, like in the equator of the block wall, that suffices sorry, for the proof uh, of non contextuality for model, right? I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I think you need, uh, you just, but, mm, yeah. yeah, yeah, but like, uh, I think there is some argument that as, as far as positive quasi probability representations are concerned, like when you have infinite amount of states, then you somehow cannot do it, right? By uh, okay. in this model in this uh, framework. So it, it, it somehow, uh, I mean, that, that gives some hope because, you know, this, this continuous time evolution is a, 
like enforces somehow the um, continuity of the set of states. Mm. Well, of course, you're not asking to reproduce all of those operational features that you were mentioning. You're not asking to, because otherwise you will get a proof of contextuality, but it wouldn't have anything to do with the working of the end. Sure, no, I understand. But I'm saying that this is something which, like, maybe, like, it, uh, maybe this condition can be relaxed. This is what I'm saying. Like, some, or some hope. Yeah. Uh, okay, we have one more question from, from Raphael. Uh, okay. Is this scheme of certification of linear response scenario device independent? Um, I think uh, I wouldn't call it. Um, no, I w so if you mean in the sense of non locality, I wouldn't, I, 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 no, I wouldn't say so. I think it's maybe what people call semi device independent in the sense that there are certain assumptions that go into it. So the assumptions are essentially that um, you need to, um, here, where is it? Let me see. Uh, you need to, um, to verify this operational condition. No? So you need to verify if you were to do an experiment. Yes. So you, you would need to verify this condition here, no? That these two things are uh, operationally equivalent. To do that, you need some assumption about what constitutes a tomographically complete set of measurements, no? Because it could be that, you know, you're just, it, they look the same, but just because you don't know all of the possible measurements, no? So the, uh, the first order answer is that, no, you need to assume that you access a, a, a tomographic complete set of measurement. In practice, uh, uh, there are some results that you need a bit less than that. Uh, there are certain results that tell you that even if you don't know some measurements, it's still okay, as long as you know that there are, in, let's say, uh, too many uh, measurements that are not known. So there are some results along those lines from Matt Pusin. But in any case, it is a, a semi-device independent, I would say, um, even though I don't know if that's uh, technically what people uh, call semi-device independent. There is some assumption on those, uh, these assumptions that I mentioned. Cool. All right. Thanks for, I... for asking. Uh, oh, Pavel, do you want to ask something more? So, we are really uh, massaging uh, Matteo quite strongly. Good. <laughs> so, well, I'm very happy uh, to get questions. So I would I would ask again about this this work uh, work definition in fact because when you are using unitary you are somehow assuming that during this work extraction process there is no heat flowing into the system, and I was wondering if you relax it a bit such that the entropy of the system actually can change. Um, uh, do you have any intuition if in this scenario? one should be still possible to uh, certify uh, that some that the um, quantum uh, performance when when it comes to the work extracted actually cannot be similar level um, it seems to me that we are really relying on the fact that that this is the unitary dynamics uh, but do you know if this if this proof is somehow stable with respect to deviations from so you want to know if it works if you is a channel rather than a Yes. Uh -huh. So, um, so yes. So uh, basically, it um, so the the um, the theorem here. It's that this change in this observable uh, is bounded in both directions by something that is of order. Uh, you have an upper and lower bound. And the change is of order v squared. So for one of the two. I would need to check which one. Uh, you don't need to assume that U is uh, unitary. You, it can be anything, as long as uh, you have got this decomposition. Then, of course, it's a question of checking if this decomposition exists or not. Now, this decomposition with identity plus something else. Mm -hmm. um, so in principle, it works uh, beyond unitary. Uh, for the other direction, the inequality, you're using that um well you're using that essentially that this is this is the identity so 
uh, so okay, it's on the maybe okay. You can relax a little bit from saying it's unitary, but uh, essentially, yeah, um, you're using that that it can be inverted. Uh, so I think it is unitary, in fact, because mm -hmm. as a channel equality. So yeah, so I think you're using the fact that uh, yeah, it is a unitary. Uh, yeah, it's a unitary dynamics here. For, for this other inequality. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, uh, can I ask one more question, Matteo? Sorry, because we are keeping you for, uh, yeah, for quite a while, but it was a very interesting talk. Can I? No, no, please. So, uh, just, okay, it's like a technical question to some, uh, in some sense. So, you presented in the, in the uh, you presented as if it is, like in this uh, linear response, uh, uh, use this framework of linear response, but when you were sketching the proof, what seemed to be like important there when I was trying to figure it out in my head is that when you add this U and you dagger as channels, this linear terms, they tend to cancel, linear te terms in yeah. G, right? So mm -hmm. my question is like, uh, does the proof in a sense works just if you have pure quantum, like just some uh, autonomous uh, Hamiltonian dynamics, and then instead of G, you look on T, like expansion time? Yeah, yeah, it does. So you just need, everything that you really need is, you've got some dynamics, um, how should I call it? So you've got some dynamics, you with some parameter, there may be time, as you say, mm -hmm. uh, you need that, you need to find some other okay as i was uh, answering to pavel uh, okay there are two inequalities and only one of the two works in the simple way but let me then say mm -hmm. so you just need to find some other channel such mm -hmm. that this is mixed to um mixes to almost the identity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, where this is uh, order t square um, and you need to see, uh, you need to verify that if I now just apply my unitary, now I look at how the observable O changes. So delta O from, this is O computed on rho minus O computed on uh, epsilon sure, T of sure, rho. Sure. So if this is of order uh, T, then you have, oh, it's coming out, but uh, this is over the T, then um, sure, this is enough uh, for, uh, yeah, to, to get uh, at least a contradiction. Maybe not both sides of this inequality, but at least you find a contradiction. Mm -hmm. So one of the two, certainly you cannot. So yeah, it is more general, even though the, let's say the natural situation where I saw it applied is this linear response, but there may be other, <laughs> scenarios where this could be interesting. Well, sometimes, like for some class of dynamics, like when you have like some spin echo or something, it might, I don't know, I, like sometimes this noise dynam that dynamics can be also reversed, right? Like, mm, okay. But okay, this is just, okay. Uh, are there any more questions, comments to Matteo? So, okay, if, if not, we uh, okay. We can uh, let's thank him again for uh, for his time and very nice presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>